Hey guys, this is Justin, hello, and welcome to another video. We're continuing our hashtag AskX series today with a question from that guy 45177 who says, what were the other superstar destroyers other than the executor doing during and after the original trilogy? Who were their captains? What did they do, etc." Really interesting question. And if you'd potentially like one of yours answered in a future video, leave it down in the comments with the hashtag AskX. Now, how many superstar destroyers were there? This is an interesting question and I've actually went and cataloged as many as I could find in Star Wars Legends, and I came to an approximate guess of 50. Briefly, that includes nine Super Star Destroyers destroyed in Imperial Command, the Super Star Destroyer at Fondor, the Ark Hammer, six Warlord or Small Imperial Faction Super Star Destroyers, two captured Super Star Destroyers, three Super Star Destroyers which were in the Black Fleet, 12 which took part in the Core Assault during the Dark Empire campaign, the Megador and the Dominion, the Eclipse 1 and 2, at least four Bellator and deserters based on the art from the new essential guide to warfare plus at least six dreadnoughts from the republic era the super star destroyers of the deep core plus perhaps some others and yeah that's 50 that's sort of a very basic answering of the question in canon the empire had 13 super star destroyers that's detailed in aftermath life debt in short they had 13 most were destroyed or lost the new republic managed to capture three the ravager destroyed at jakku and the eclipse served as the flagship which started off the first order. So I want to talk about legends and instead of going over the details of every single Super Star Destroyer, I thought I would take five, which I think end up being the most impactful for Star Wars history. Let's start off with arguably the most famous Super Star Destroyer not named the Executor, the Lusankia. The Lusankia was the second Super Star Destroyer built and as we learned in the X-Wing series, it was hidden within the surface of Coruscant and used as essentially a prison and reconditioning center for the Empire. People would go into the Lusankia and they'd come out Imperial sleeper agents. When Coruscant was captured, the Super Star Destroyer broke from the planet's surface and for a time was operated by Azani Isard and her faction before being captured by the New Republic. Lusankia took a significant amount of time to repair but was used in major campaigns, but its most famous moment was during the Yuzhan Vong War. Wedge Antilles was holding Borlias, a key crossroads planet that the Yuzhan Vong were attacking in numbers. The Lusankia was used in two very unconditional ways to inflict massive damage on the Vong as the New Republic held out. First off, it was used in a base Delta Zero of the planet, destroying thousands if not tens of thousands of Yuzhan Vong warriors. The New Republic was not known for using Star Destroyers or Super Star Destroyers to orbitably bombard planets, so it was unexpected. Later, the damaged ship was rammed into a Yuzhan Vong world ship as a part of Operation Emperor's Spear. It destroyed the warship along Alongside arguably the Yuzhan Vong's most decorated and revered war mind and elder, and that ended up being just a massive, massive loss for the Vong. As a note, the Lusankia was not the only Super Star Destroyer used by the New Republic. There was also at least one other, the Guardian. But the next ship I want to talk about is the Iron Fist, which was the flagship of Warlord Zinge. So one thing you have to understand about Super Star Destroyers is that they were given out by the Emperor as a sign of his favor and a person's status within the Imperial High. Hierarchy. That's why Vader got one. I'll probably do a video at some point why Thrawn didn't get one if you're interested. But that's also why then Imperial Admiral Zinj was given a Super Star Destroyer named the Brawl. After the death of Palpatine and the loss at Endor, the Empire, which was left without a figurehead, cracked into many small parts. Imperial warlords popped up, largely buoyed by their existing forces, and many of the most powerful warlord factions actually had a Super Star Destroyer under their command. That was the case with with Zinj and the Iron Fist. The Iron Fist and Zinj were basically one in the same. He used it to harass New Republic worlds, and in response, the New Republic created Solo Command, a fleet of ships dedicated to hunting Zinj down. The Iron Fist would be destroyed at the Battle of Dathomir, where it would be trapped by Hapen Battle Dragons using interdiction mines. Appropriately, it would be Han Solo and the Millennium Falcon who would fire the final killing blow, ending not only the great ship, but Zinj mini empire. The next vessel I want to discuss is the Megador. I've actually done an entire video on the Megador where I looked at literally every single in-text reference that's been made to the ship. If you look up Eckhart's Ladder Megador, you'll be able to find it. We don't know a whole lot about the ship itself. We don't even actually know its specific class. It seems to be something slightly different than an executor, but either way, it was obviously produced during the Empire's heyday. As the new essential guide to warfare explains, the Megador 
Negador, alongside its sister ship, the Dominion, were discovered in Imperial shipyards of the Deep Core, and it would go on to serve under Pelion's Imperial Remnant. What makes the Megador slightly different is that it continued to see service through the formation of the GA and beyond. The Megador was Pelion's flagship through the Swarm War, and throughout Legacy of the Force and Fate of the Jedi, it somewhat surprisingly serves as a base for the good guys. The Megador is a really interesting ship because we never get a whole lot of details regarding what it actually is. I always sort of imagined that it was some sort of experimental Super Star Destroyer and that it was further upgraded after the Battle of Endor, which is why it was able to see service for so long. But I mean, that speculation not really based on evidence. Next up, we have the Pride of Yavetha, a ship that originally started off its life as the Intimidator. Now, the Black Fleet Crisis is actually a pretty interesting event. I've covered it on the channel a few times. In short, as explained in the Black Fleet Crisis, which, by the way, if you enjoy the more military side of Star Wars, that's the most military sci-fi the books ever get. But anyway, the Empire has a series of shipyards in the core. One of them is known as Black 15, which is above the planet Nazoth, homeworld of the Avathans. The Avathans, who were incredibly gifted in pretty much anything science and engineering, ended up revolting. They had been slave labor for the Empire, seizing the shipyards and all of their vessels. So basically in the post-Endor era, the Yavathan Duskon League emerged onto the scene with a fleet, including several Super Star Destroyers, a bunch of ISDs, some of their own custom Yavathan thrust ships, and they're a problem for the New Republic. Anyway, the Duskon League ends up being defeated. The pride of Yavatha is not outright destroyed in battle, but we learn in the new essential chronology that the New Republic finds it later and it's no longer in workable order. The Black Fleet Crisis is also, according to the Essential Guide to Warfare, one of the reasons the New Republic decided, hey, we need to build some large vessels, and that led to ships like the Viscount. The last Super Star Destroyer we'll talk about today is the Reaper, and I'll be pretty brief with this one. It's another executor. It's another warlord ship. Instead of belonging to Zinj, however, this one belonged to Grand Moff Artis Kane. The Reaper has an interesting history. It was sort of a part of a proto death squadron called Scourge Squadron, hunting the Rebel Alliance throughout the Outer Rim. After the Battle of Endor, it became the heart of a new Imperial faction known as the Pentastar Alignment. What's different about the Reaper is it actually wasn't destroyed during the Warlord era. It would go with many Imperial forces to Biss and join Palpatine's reborn form for Operation Shadow Hand. It would survive that and would go on to serve under Pelion's new Imperial Remnant about 10 years after Endor. Have you ever seen that image of two Super Star Destroyers facing off and just broadsiding the hell out of each other at close range? Well, those are actually both ships featured in today's video. The one with the Rebel Alliance insignia is the Lusankia, the other one is the Reaper. That battle was actually a pretty major tactical victory for the Empire. I've covered it in depth in a battle breakdown. However, the success of the early Arinda campaign ended up making the Moths of the Imperial Remnant a little too excited. They overextended their hand and the Reaper was finally destroyed at the Battle of Selenon. I've got to say, if Star Wars Legends were still a thing being actively worked on and Lucasfilm hired me as a writer, I would definitely do a short story highlighting the Reaper, just like five different entries, brief looks at the ship throughout its different life under Imperial service, then service of the Pentastar alignment in the Imperial Remnant, the Dark Empire, finally the Battle of Selenon and its eventual destruction. I've always thought that ships are a really cool way to tell a story in Star Wars, especially ships that move factions or fight in so many key battles. But that's all I've got for today. Those are five Imperial Super Star Destroyers, who commanded them and what happened to them after the Battle of Endor, plus a more general look at what happened to all the big ships after that one crashed into the Death Star. But that's all I've got for today. Until next time, be safe, have a good one, and of course, may the Force be with you. Bye-bye.